from Cambridge, Massachusetts, it's The Cube, covering MIT Chief Data Officer and Information Quality Symposium 2019, brought to you by SiliconANGLE Media. Welcome back to MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts, everybody. You're watching The Cube, the leader in live tech coverage. My name is Dave Vellante, and it's my pleasure to introduce Matt Kobe, who's the Vice President of Business Strategy and Analytics at the Chicago Bulls. We love talking sports, we love <laughs> talking data. Matt, thanks for coming on. No problem, good to be here, Dave. So talk about your role as the head of uh, analytics for the Bulls. Sure, so I, w I work exclusively on the business side of the operation, so we have a separate team that does the basketball side, which is kind of your player stuff. But on the business side, um, what we're focused on is really two things. One is being essentially internal consultants for the rest of the customer facing functions. So we work a lot with ticketing, a lot with sponsorship, um, marketing, digital, all of those folks that engage with our customer base. And then on the back, side, back end of it, we're building out the technical infrastructure for the organization, right? So everything from data warehouse to CRM to email marketing, all of that sits with my team. And so we wear a lot of hats, uh, which is exciting. Um, but at the end of the day, we're trying to use data to enhance the customer and fan experience. Um, and that's our aim and that's what we're driving towards. So, so success in sports, <laughs> in a larger respect, has come down to, don't be offended by this, is who's got the best geeks? <laughs> and so, <laughs> now, your, your side of the house is not about, like you say, player performance. Correct. It's about the business performance. Business but performance. That's, a, that's a big part of getting the best players. I mean, if that's you're successful, correct. And I don't know the nuances of the NBA salary cap and everything else, but I think there is one. Yeah. And so that makes it even more important, but yep. you're helping fund you know, that in, a, in, yeah. in various ways. But in so, are, are, the, are the two teams like completely separate? Is there a Chinese wall between them, or are you part of the sort of same group? Um, we're pretty separate. So, so the, the basketball folks do their thing, the business folks do their thing from an analytics standpoint. We meet and we collaborate on tools and other methods of actually doing the analysis, but in terms of, um, the analysis itself, there is a little bit of separation there. Um, and mainly that is from a priority standpoint. Obviously, the, the basketball stuff is the most important stuff, and so if we were working on both sides, then we'd always be doing the basketball stuff, and the business <laughs> stuff needs to get done. So. It would drag you into that. <laughs> exactly. Never, okay, but so which came first, the chicken or the egg? Was it, was it the sort of post money ball uh, activity applied to the NBA? And I want to ask you a question about that, and yep. then Somebody said, hey, we should do this for the business side, or was the business side sort of always there? I think, I think the business side, and probably in the last five to seven years, you've really seen it grown. So if you look at the NBA, I've been with the Bulls for five years. If you look at the NBA seven, eight years ago, there was a handful of business analytics teams, and those, fo those teams had one or two people at them. Now, every single team in the NBA has some sort of business analytics team, and the average staff is seven. So my staff is six full-time folks plus myself, so we're right at, right at the average. And I think what you've seen is everything has become more complex in sports, right? If you look at ticketing, you've got all the secondary markets, you have all this data flowing in, and they need someone to make sense of all that data. If you look at sponsorship, sponsorship has transitioned from selling a sign that sits on the side of the court to these truly integrated partnerships where our partners are coming to us and saying, what do we get out of this? What was our return? And so you're seeing a lot more part, lot more collaboration between analytics and sponsorship to go back to those partners and say, hey, here's what we delivered. And so I think you, it started on the basketball side, certainly, because that's, that's where the, you know, that is the most important piece, but um, it quickly followed on the business side because they saw the value that that type of thinking can bring to the business. So, and I know this is not, you know, your swim lane, but, but you know, the lore of Billy Bean and Moneyball and all that uh, as sort of the starting point for sports analytics, is yep. that, is that, is that a fair um, characterization? Of, yeah, I mean. Of, was, that, was that really the mainspring of all this? I mean, this? I, I think it, it probably started even before that. I think if you, I've gone and see Billy Bean at the MIT Sports Analytics Conference and him talk and he always references kind of Bill James as, as yeah, one of, of the first. And so I think it, it started, baseball was, I wouldn't say the easiest place to start, but it was all, it's, it's a one versus one, right? It's pitcher versus batter in a lot of cases. Um, Basketball is a little bit more fluid. It's a team sport, it's a little harder, but I think as technology has advanced, um, there's been more and more opportunities to do the analytics on the basketball side. And on the business side, I think what you're seeing is this huge, what we've heard the first day and a half here, this huge influx of data, not nearly to the levels of the MasterCards and others of the world, but um, as more and more things move to the mobile phone, I think you're going to see this huge influx of data on the business side 
and you're going to need the same systems and the same sort of approach to tackle it. Yeah, so Bill James is the ultimate uh, you know, sports geek, and he's responsible for all these stats that no, none of us <laughs> understand, and he's why we don't pay attention to batting average anymore. <laughs> of course, I still do. So let's talk about the business side of things. Yep. If you think about the business of, of baseball, you know, it's all about maximizing the gate. Yeah, there's, there's some revenue, a lot of revenue, of course, from, from TV, but it's not like football, which is dominated yep. by, the, by the TV. Basketball, I think, is probably a mix, right? You got an 80, whatever, 82 game season, so yep. you know, filling up the stadium is, 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 imp is important. You obviously, you know, NBA has done a great job of, of really you know, getting it right. Free agency is like fascinating now. So yeah, it's, it's a really, 12 months a year it's sport. Really, it's, 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 <laughs> we talk about the NBA all the time. And of course, you know, people like, like celebrities like LeBron have, have certainly helped and, yep. and, and now a whole batch of others. But what's the money uh, side of, of the NBA look like? Where's the money coming from? Yeah, I mean, I think you certainly have broadcast, right? But in many ways, like national broadcast sort of takes care of it itself in some ways from the standpoint of my team doesn't have a lot of control over national broadcast money. That's a league level type thing. And so right. the things that we have control over, the two big buckets are ticketing and sponsorship. Those, those are the two big buckets of revenue um, that my team spends a lot of time on. Ticketing is, is one that is important from the standpoint, as you say, which is like, how do we fill the building, right? We've got 41 home games plus three preseason games. We've got 44 events a year. Our goal is to fill the building for all 44 of those events, and we do a pretty good job of doing it, but that has cascading effects into other revenue streams, right? As you think about concessions and merchandise and sponsorship, it's a lot easier to spell sell a sponsorship when your building is full than if your building isn't full. And so our focus is on how do we, how do we fill the building in the most efficient way possible, and as you have things like the secondary market and um, people have access to tickets in different ways than they did 10 to 15 years ago. I think that becomes increasingly complex. Um, but that's the fun area. That's, like where, that's where we spend a lot of time. There's the pricing, there's inventory management. It's a lot of, you know, as you look at traditional CPG, there's, there's some of those same principles being applied, which is how do you, or you look at airline, right? They're, they're selling a plane, it's an asset you have to fill. We have a, a building that's an asset we have to fill, and how do we fill it in the most optimal way? So the idea of surge pricing, uh, uh, demand and supply, but so uh, several years ago the Red Sox went to a tiered pricing. Yep. You guys do the same. You have the, you, if, the, if the Sox are playing Kansas City Royals, is the, the tickets you know, way cheaper than if they're playing the Yankees. Right? Yeah. You guys do a similar type so of thing? So we do it uh, for single game tickets. So for our season ticket holders, it's the same price for, for every game, um, but on the pri or for primary tickets for single games, right? So if we're playing um, you know, this year it'll be the Clippers and the Lakers, that price is going to be much more expensive. So we dynamically price on a game-to-game -game basis, um, but our season ticket holders pay the same Why, why don't you do it for the season ticket holders? Um, Just haven't gone there yet? Or? Yeah, I mean, there, some teams have, right? So there's, there's a few different approaches. You can variably price those, those tickets. I think for, for us, the, there's, in years past, the last few years in particular, there's been a couple of flagship games and then every other game feels similar. I think this will be the first year where you have eight to 10 teams that really have a shot at, at winning the title. And so I think you'll see a more balanced schedule. Um, and so we've, we've talked about it a lot. We just haven't gone to that made that move yet. Well, I, as a season ticket holder that shares his tickets with like seven <laughs> other guys with the Red Sox, because <laughs> you see, you could, you could buy a BMW or you could, you know, <laughs> share the tickets. So, uh, so but, but I would love it if they didn't do the tiered pricing as a season ticket holder. So I hope you hold off for a little while, but, <laughs> but I don't know, it could maximize revenues. Uh, you know, if the Red Sox do, it's probably not a stupid thing because they're smart people. What about the sponsorships? This is fascinating about the partners looking for ROI. Yep. How are you measuring that? You're building, a, you're forging a tighter relationship, obviously, with these sponsors and these partners. Yeah. What's that ROI look like? How are yeah, you measuring so that? Yeah, so it's measured a variety of different ways, largely based on the assets that they deliver, but I think every single partner we talk to these days, um, I also lead the sponsorship team. So I oversee, it's, it's rare in, in sports, but I sit over business strategy and analytics and the sponsorship team. Um, it's not my title, but in, in practice, that's what I do. And I think everyone we talk to wants digital, right? They want, we've got over 25 million social media followers with the Bulls, right? We've got 19 million on Facebook alone. And so sponsors see those numbers and they know that we can deliver impression. They know we can deliver engagement and they want access to those channels. And so from a return on, I always call it return on objectives, right? Return on investment is a little bit tricky, um, but return on objectives is if we're trying to build brand awareness, 
we're going to go back to them and say, here's how many people came to our arena and saw your, your logo and saw the feature that you had on the scoreboard. If you're on our social media channels or our website, here's the number of impressions you got. Here's the number of engagements you got. I think where we're at now is more is better. More is still better, right? Everyone wants the, the big numbers. I think where you're starting to see it move, though, is that more isn't always better. We want the right folks engaging with our brands. And that's really what we're starting to think about is if you get 10 million impressions, but they're 10 million impressions to the wrong group of potential customers, that's not terribly helpful for a brand. We're trying to work with our brands to reach the right demographics that they want to reach in order to actually build that brand awareness they want to build. What, what, are, you, what are your primary social channels? I mean, Twitter, obviously. Yeah, so, so every platform has a different purpose. Um, we have Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat. Uh, we're on we Weibo in, in China. Um, and, you know, every platform has a different function. Twitter is obviously more real-time news. Um, you know, the timeline stuff, it, it falls off really quick. Instagram is really the artistic piece of it. Um, and then Facebook is a blend of both. And so that's kind of how we deploy our channels. We have a whole social team that generates content and, and, and pushes that content out. Um, but those are the channels we use and those are incredibly valuable. Now, what you're starting to see is those channels are changing very rapidly um, based on their, their own set of algorithms of how they deliver content to, to fans. And so we're having to continue to adapt to those changing environments in those social channels. So impressions and in, in the, the term impressions varies by right. these various platforms. So, yep. so I, know, I know I'm more familiar with Twitter impressions. They, I mean, yep. they have this uh, definition. It's not just somebody who might have seen it. It's somebody who they, they believe actually you know, spent a few seconds looking at yep. it. They have some algorithm to figure that out. Yeah. Is that a, a metric that you finding your brands are, are, are buying into, for example? Yeah, I mean, I think certainly they're they view, it's, it's kind of the old, you know, when you bought TV ads, it's how many households saw my commercial, right? It's, right. it's a similar type of metric of how many eyeballs saw the piece of content that we put out. I think where the, the metrics more people are starting to care about is engagements, which is how many people actually engaged with that piece of content, whether it's a like, a comment, a share. Because um, then that's actual, yeah, you might have seen it for three seconds, but we know how things work, you're scrolling pretty fast, but if you actually stop to engage it with something, um, that's where I think brands are starting to see value. And as we think about our content, we have a, a framework that our digital team uses, but one of the pillars of that is thumb stopping. Like we want to create content that is thumb stopping that people actually engage with. And that's been a big focus of ours the last couple of years. And I presume you're using video in a huge way. Yeah, right? video. Um, we've got a whole graphics team that does custom graphics for whether it's stats or for hist historical anniversaries. Um, we have a whole in-house production team that does higher end, and then our digital team does more kind of straight from the phone, raw footage. So we're using a variety of different mediums to reach our fans. Now Matt, what's your background? How did you get into all this? I spent seven years in consulting. So I worked for Deloitte uh, in their strategy group out of Chicago, and I worked for CPG companies, like at the intersection of retailer and CPG. So a lot of in-store promotional work, um, helping brands think through just general revenue management pricing strategy, promotional strategy, and um, stumbled upon greatness with the Bulls job. Um, a friend gave me the heads up that they were looking to fill this type of role, and I was able to get my resume in the mix, and was lucky enough to get, get the job, and it's been, um, I, when I started, we were single, I was single shingle, so it was a team of one. Um, five years later, we're a team of six, and we'll probably keep growing, so it's been an exciting ride. And, and your background is math, stats? What, uh, I was business undergrad, and then I got a, I went to Indiana undergrad, business, and then went to Kellogg Northwestern, got an MBA um, in strategy. So um, that's my background, but it's, you know, I've, I've dabbled in sports. I worked for the Chicago 2016 Olympic bid back in the day when I was at Deloitte. Um, and so it's been, it's always been a dream of mine. I just never knew how I'd get there. Like I always just wanted to work in sports. I just didn't know the path. And I'm lucky enough to find the path a lot earlier than I thought. How about this conference? I mean, I, I know you've been to other MIT events. Yeah. Um, how about this one, how we found it, so, some of the key takeaways, things you've I think this has been great because a lot of the conferences we go to are really sports focused. So you've got the MIT Sports Analytics Conference, you have SEAT, you have um, MBA type um, programming that they put on, but it's nice to get out of sports and sort of see how other bigger industries are thinking about some of the problems, specifically around data management and, and the influx of data and how they're thinking about it. It's always nice to kind of elevate and just have some room to breathe and think. Um, and meet people that are, are not in sports and start to build those, you know, 
relationships and with thought leaders and things like that. So I, it's been great. It's my first time here, um, but I'll probably be back. Good. Matt, well, hopefully you get to see a game, even though the Red Sox aren't playing that well. And thanks so much for coming to theCUBE. No problem. Sharing your thoughts. Appreciate you having me. All right, it was great to have you. All right, keep it right there, everybody. I'll be back with our next guest with Paul Gill and Dave Vellante here in the house. You're watching theCUBE from MIT, CDOIQ. Be right back. <laughs>